Fallout is one of my favorite video game franchises of all time. One of its most memorable aspects is its retrofuturism, the aesthetics of how people in the mid-20th century had imagined the future to be. One among many of the influences that the creators of Fallout drew from was Forbidden Planet, a sci-fi movie from 1956. When Forbidden Planet was created, it was genuinely trying to invoke the future, to capture what it might be like, and to anticipate it by actively creating new conceptions of the future. Not only did the movie prove that big-budget science fiction could be successful, it was the first major movie to have an entirely electronic soundtrack, which you are hearing now. The electronic soundtrack did not simply consist of already familiar melodies being played on new synthesizers, it sounded genuinely strange and futuristic, giving one a glimpse of a different world. By the time that the movie's aesthetic was revived in Fallout in 1997, it was no longer a glimpse or an anticipation of the future. It had become a crystallized artifact, which, rather than evoking the future like Forbidden Planet did, evokes a long-gone hope for a future that never arrived. In the late Mark Fisher's terms, it became a lost future. The future had been cancelled. When talking about Mark Fisher's ideas of lost futures, and of the cancellation of the future, it is important to first be familiar with hauntology, a term coined by Derrida. Derrida used the word hauntology to refer to the way in which we never encounter things as fully present, as fully there. In all of our experiences, the present is always mixed up with the past and the future. That which is present is always mixed up with that which is absent. We can only make sense of any present moment by comparing it with the past and anticipating the future. To give a simple example, imagine hearing a simple melody. At any single moment, you are only hearing one of the notes. Only one of the notes is fully present. On its own, this single tone has no melodic qualities, and the only way to make sense of the melody as a melody is to constantly mix the present note with the notes that you are no longer hearing on the one hand and the notes that you are anticipating on the other. The melody is never fully present, but only arises from an interplay between the past, present, and future. All of our experience is like this. We can only make sense of the future through the past, and only make sense of the past through the future. Derrida's entire philosophical project is ontological. If you have seen my Sonic Adventure 2 analysis, you'll remember how either pole of a binary is never fully present, because it is always mixed up with its opposite, even sustained by its opposite. Because of this, our experience is quote-unquote haunted, haunted by that which no longer exists, and by that which does not yet exist. Our experience is ghostly, as it can be absent, yet real. The term ontology is an example of how much attention Derrida paid to language and terminology. It is a combination of the words haunt and ontology. Ontology is a branch of philosophy that studies the nature of being. Therefore, hauntology is a kind of ontology, which sees being not as fully present, but as in a sense ghostly. But this is not all. In the original French, the age in haunt is silent, and therefore both ontology and ontology are in fact pronounced the same. The word itself functions as part of a deconstruction of the speech-writing binary, where speech is the privileged term, because the word can only be fully present in writing. At the same time, the word is in a sense ontological, because it differentiates itself from ontology through a letter that is real, yet silent. Real, yet absent. The way the term ontology has been popularized by Mark Fisher in cultural theory is a lot more specific though. It refers to a kind of cultural ontology, the way we are haunted by our past in our media, art, and entertainment, often referring to the way in which we paradoxically try to relive our anticipations of a future by going back to the past. According to Mark Fisher, because of the dominance of neoliberalism, we have reached a cultural impasse. People are no longer trying to anticipate the future, to conceive of new worlds. Neoliberalism demands of us short-term solutions, quick results, and the repetition of old, already established cultural forms. There's an important distinction to be made here. It is of course true that technological progress hasn't stopped, and is probably accelerating. But here's the crucial difference. While in the past, the emergence of new technologies enabled the emergence of new cultural forms, today, new technologies are subordinated to the repetition and refurbishment of old, already established cultural forms. In the 80s, the theorist Frederick Jameson critiqued the postmodern cultural condition, predicting that it would be increasingly characterized by revivalism and pastiche. Today, this is more true than it was then, and currently is seen most clearly in 80s revivalism. 
Because of our condition, we have unlearned the creation of the future. It often seems that we are no longer capable of creating something that seems futuristic, of imagining or anticipating something otherworldly. The future has been cancelled, and the hauntological aspect of this is that ironically, to try to relive and recapture the disappearing hopes for the future, we return to the past, trying to rediscover how the future was imagined back then. Mark Fisher compares this, among other things, to the condition of Leonard in Christopher Nolan's movie Memento. Leonard suffers from enterograde amnesia. He has permanent memories up to a certain point in his life, but is incapable of making new ones. His only way of orienting himself with regards to changes in the world is through pictures, notes, and tattoos. Our cultural condition is like a collective enterograde amnesia, the inability to create new cultural forms, and thereby being doomed to orient ourselves to the same past again and again. Notice that even contemporary futuristic movies are mostly characterized by reviving the past, whether in repeating plots and themes already explored in blockbusters of past decades, or more explicitly adopting 80s aesthetics, referencing 80s culture, and creating soundtracks that imitate 80s analog synthesizers. You see it even in movie posters. TV shows, and even fellow YouTubers too, are following this trend through analog synth music and neon color schemes popularized in the 80s. There seems to be an increasing amount of music videos that try to hauntingly relive the old, being shot on VHS cameras or edited to look grainy. It seems like we have become more excited about reliving the past than imagining new futures. We are more interested in the aesthetics we are able to imitate and revive rather than the aesthetics we can create. It is seen in video games too, for example, in the resurgence of pixel art and chiptune music in indie games. This reaches a certain kind of paradox. The newest kinds of technology end up being used to recreate and imitate old kinds of technology. The recent movie Ready Player One takes place in the future, yet in its most important moments and aspects it simply replays the past, both on the level of form and content. The movie's virtual world, Oasis, is an amalgamation of past cultural icons, such as Godzilla, the DeLorean from Back to the Future, or the Iron Giant, and it is notable that the characters even return to the set of Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. As Mark Fisher points out, the hotel in The Shining is explicitly hauntological. One door leads into a ballroom playing 1920s pop music, while another reveals a young woman whose body suddenly becomes old and decaying. The Shining is a movie about the past using us to repeat itself, and the characters of Ready Player One revisiting this architecture of haunting makes it doubly hauntological. Although Ready Player One's virtual world is presented as unreal, it is not very different from ours, populated by cultural references to the past that have been taken out of their old contexts and placed in spaces that are repeatable and replicable. It is no accident that in the past decade we have seen the emergence of new genres like vaporwave and hypnagogic pop, which are inherently characterized by a feeling of returning to the past. Vaporwave is created by sampling 80s and 90s pop songs, movie soundtracks and commercials, and slowing them down, looping them, splicing them in different ways and adding reverb. As strange as this genre might have seemed when it first came into prominence, it perfectly reflects our cultural condition as seen by Mark Fisher. Our cultural development has slowed down, perhaps even started looping indefinitely, repeatedly letting the past return. This condition constitutes a grand and looming atmosphere that we can't get out of. In the case of Vaporwave, new technologies, such as accessible audio workstation software and the internet that allows the music to spread like never before, is subordinated to the looping and repetition of the sounds of the past. Ready Player One is no different in this aspect. Its cutting-edge visual effects and computer-generated imagery are entirely subordinated to the demands of past cultural forms. Don't get me wrong here, I'm not denouncing all media that does this. There is clearly something appealing, something cool about the aesthetics that are being revived. But the important question is, why do we find them so appealing? Why now? The point of Fisher's analysis is not just to criticize culture characterized by lost futures, but to ask what these trends are a symptom of, and what they say about our current condition. Is this trend of nostalgia an accident? Or are we, as Fisher believed, part of a culture that, because of the condition it has found itself in, can only find appeal in pre-established cultural modes, in repetition, in rehashes, in caging ourselves in the safety of the familiar. The correlate of a future that will not arrive is a past that won't disappear. 
The past cultural forms that will not let us move on are like the rooms of the video game worlds. In the 90s, this was a popular online multiplayer game, but over the years became almost completely abandoned. If Worlds was a material structure, it would be falling into ruins, but its digital nature prevents it from ever decaying. A structure that cannot decay is a structure that cannot provide space for new structures. The eerie result is an architecture that is clearly outdated but unchanging, dragging behind the present. A world stuck in time. For Fisher, this is our world. I'd like to thank my Patreon supporters, Kelly Rankin, John Drum, Derek Andres, Yvonne, Jinsu An, Gibbering Idiot, Jamie Street, Carrie, Juan Chavez, Timur Mar, Numu, Andrew Burns, Michael Doherty, D. Lang, Sina B. Isabel Abdelali, Robert Phillips, Adam Johns, Baba Golshahi, Tendies123, John Beatles, Susie O, and Industrial Robot. I'm sorry for any names I mispronounced, but thank you for watching.